begins with Matthew 21, 12 through 46. Matthew 21, 12 through 46. We read here the word of God. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise? Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves, and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. Now, when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And all things, whatever you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Now, when he came into the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reason among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. The tax collectors and harlots believed him, and when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower, and he leased it to the vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. And last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to 
other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls in this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. Now, we're going to go to the parallel passage of Mark 11, 12 through 25. Mark 11, 12 through 25. Now, the next day, when they had come out of Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if, if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. So they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves? And the scribes and chief priests heard it and, and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. And when evening had come, he went out of the city. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. So far, the reading of God's word. Let us rise and sing together 1B, 1 and 2.
text, brothers and sisters, is Matthew 21, the verses 18 through 22. We'll read that again to, to be clear what the text is. Now, in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. Now, when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And all things, whatever you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's a particular reason that I chose to preach on this passage a while back, and that's because my catechism students had asked a number of times the meaning of Jesus cursing the fig tree. This passage bugged them, and that's because Jesus Christ doesn't just curse the fig tree for not having fruit, but as Mark says, it was not the season for fruit. That's not fair, is it? How can you curse a tree for not having fruit when it's not the season for fruit? You can imagine the spring here when the snow recedes and it's starting to warm up and the trees are budding. You don't go to your apple tree expecting fruit. That's not fair. It seems like the Lord Jesus isn't being fair either. Expecting fruit out of season is like asking your four-year-old to change the oil in your car or your 10-year-old to deliver a lecture on physics at the University of Alberta. It's absurd. You don't expect those things. So there's, there's something going on here in our text that seems confusing, unfair, as if Jesus is not reasonable. And that's a problem. If anyone says to me, Jesus is not reasonable, you have to wonder, you know, is he my good shepherd? Is he my Lord and Savior? So we need to clarify this up, and I think that we will be in for a few surprises this afternoon. We summarize our text in this way, a very obvious why Jesus curses the fig tree. We'll see two things. Jesus curses the fig tree for lack of fruit, and Jesus shows the way to bear abundant fruit. Now, whenever you look at a passage in the Bible, you always look at its context, what is around it. It's a basic a biblical principle of interpretation. If you take a passage, and you take it out of its context and you look at it, you've got a really good possibility of misunderstanding it, possibly even coming up with a heresy. You've got to see what's around it. Why, why does this passage come up? Why is it in the Bible right here? And indeed, if we talked about the fact that Jesus seems unreasonable here, we've got to be very careful. You know, I, I talked this morning about some New Testament theologians. Well, there are New Testament theologians who say about this passage, uh, Jesus here is just, he's derailed. He's, he's just, you know, he's crabby. He, he just isn't reasonable. That's a serious charge. So we need to look at the context before we actually zero in on the passage itself. What do we see in the context? Well, our text is in the last few days of Jesus' life leading up to the crucifixion. He has had the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He healed the sick. He, he healed the blind and the lame. And the children were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. And to which the chief priests and the teachers of the law they reacted by, we read there in verse 15, that they were indignant. That's before our text. The spiritual leaders were indignant with Jesus. Then after our text, Jesus returns to Jerusalem, and the, and, and the leaders were trying to undermine his authority. By undermining his authority, they would totally discredit him, and they would say, you shouldn't listen to this man. So the context 
is hostility all around, before our text and after our text. But there's something else going on, and we see that in the parallel passage of Mark. Mark tells us a few different things. He shows a little bit different order in events, and the, the writers of the, the four Gospels do that. And they're under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What Mark tells us is that it's Monday morning when Jesus curses the fig tree. It's Tuesday morning when they pass by and the disciples see that the fig tree is withered. In between those two events, what Mark tells us is that Jesus goes into the temple and he sees there the money changers. He sees that the temple the place where the sacrifices take place has been turned into commerce, business, uh, exchanging money for, for animals. And of course, Jesus is indignant. He's, he says to the spiritual leaders, you have turned this into a, a den of thieves. And then what do we read? The scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. So now we're really starting to get a very clear picture of what's going on. Jesus Christ was uh, facing opposition all around, and that very, that very day of the fig tree, we see that the chief priests, the scribes, and so on, they were afraid of Jesus. They were afraid of his popularity with the people. And they said, we have got to destroy him. We're going to kill him. We're going to finish him off. We're going to murder him. It's striking that at the end of this chapter, Matthew 21, we read about the parable of the tenants. You know, you have this landowner who built, builds a vineyard, he puts tenants in it, and then he goes away, but he expects that he will get fruit from those tenants when it's ripe. So he sends servants, uh, a bunch of them, they get beaten up and stoned, some killed. So finally, the owner says, I'll send my son. They'll respect him. But they killed him too. That parable is the parable of God's church. And he sends his son to the church to find fruit, to find a people who are, are, are ready for him and, and living to the praise and the glory of God. And what do they do? They kill him. They kill him. Thankfully, the, Jesus Christ goes on and he quotes Psalm 118, the, the stone with the, which the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone or the capstone that speaks about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it is very clear to us here in Matthew 21, there is a rampant hostility by the people of Israel, especially the spiritual leadership, against Jesus Christ and against God himself. You know, sometimes we... As we read the Gospels, we think to ourselves, you know what, those guys just, they just didn't get it. The chief priests, the Pharisees, they didn't realize that Jesus was the Son of God. Are you kidding? They knew. They knew who he was. They knew he was the Son of God. But it's not the one they wanted. It's, they didn't want someone who was going to come and save them from their sins. They wanted something different, something better, perhaps someone who would deliver them from the Roman Empire. So this is the context in which we find our text. And we might just uh, elaborate a little bit further. We sang together from Psalm 1, right? Psalm 1 is such an important psalm. It sets the theme for the entire Psalter. And there we read about the righteous man who delights in the law of God, and it says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. A righteous person is like a tree bearing fruit, planted along a stream of living water, and that fruit is to the praise and the glory of God. And that's what the people of Israel should have been. What our Lord Jesus Christ should have dis discovered through his ministry, especially when he went to the temple, is a people who loved God, loved his word. We're waiting for the coming Christ. 
who would save them from their sins and secure for them an everlasting place as the children of God. But instead, the spiritual leaders of the day were rejecting him. And also, the people themselves. Earlier that week, they were saying, Hosanna, son of David. Later that week, they would be screaming at the top of their lungs, crucify him, crucify him. So what our Lord Jesus Christ is doing in this passage is he's bringing judgment and condemnation on his people. And that should be a surprise to nobody. God had warned his people in the Old Testament, if you don't love me and walk in my ways, it's finished. You see that particularly in the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, this is about the end of Moses' life, people are about to enter the promised land. You see already in chapter 8, the deep concern of God that his people will go into this land flowing with milk and honey and forget them. So as you come to the end of the book of Deuteronomy, there's a lot of warning, warning of judgment. And we see that in Deuteronomy 28, verse 62, where the Lord warns his people, you shall be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars of heaven in multitude, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. And it shall be, that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing, and you shall be plucked off from the land which you go to possess. Powerful language. I don't think I would ever dare to say this, but the Lord says it himself through his servant Moses. The Lord will rejoice in reducing you in number and plucking you from the land. God's relationship with his people is a beautiful covenant relationship. It promises everything. It expects the return of people who, who love him and bear the fruit of righteousness. But if you don't do it, the relationship's broken. Judgment will come. And that's what we see worked out in our text. What we have in our text, we call that an acted out parable. We all know what parables are. Think of the parable of the sower. They're, they're, they're very tight teaching lessons with a, with a very powerful message. Well, that's what we have in our text, but here is a parable that's a play. It's a worked out parable. Jesus goes to the fig tree, he interacts with the fig tree, and he reacts to it, and that's like a play that's an acted out parable which says something about a people who are not bearing fruit when they should have been doing so. In our text, it's early Monday morning. Jesus leaves Bethany. It's about a three-kilometer walk to Jerusalem, and Jesus is hungry. Maybe he skipped breakfast or he had uh, two smaller breakfasts, but as he's walking along, he's hungry, and then he sees a fig tree by the side of the road. And he goes over it because maybe he can have some figs and, and eat them. The concept is maybe a little strange for us here in, in Alberta, we're a different climate than Palestine. But where I grew up in southern Ontario, when my brothers and I used to, to roam the fields and the roads, there was a pear tree growing by the ditch, an apple tree, a cherry tree. You could just take it. It was, it was just you know, public property. You could do that. I was just in France a few weeks ago, and we'd walk along the canals and the road. There are fig trees everywhere. They grow like weeds on the side of the road. You can just take a, a fig and eat it. You're a, allowed to do that. And that's what our Lord Jesus Christ hoped to do. But there is a wrinkle in this, and that wrinkle is mentioned by Mark. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Of course, what we're all wondering is why in the world would Jesus Christ expect fruit on a fig tree when it was not the season for figs? This is the Passover week. It's exactly the same time as our Easter weekend, so end of March, beginning of April. Who expects figs? No, that, that's more like end of August or September, something like that. But there's something that you have to know about Mark. Mark is a very unique gospel, very short, very crisp, very action type of gospel. And, and, and Mark has a, a certain 
way of writing that's, that's quite unique, and we wouldn't do that in English. What Mark does is that he, he makes a statement, number one. He makes another statement, and then thirdly, he gives an explanation. And now in English, we think that explanation is for the second sentence, when in actual fact, it's for the first sentence. I'm not making this up. Scholars know this. You can read it in the commentaries. So when we read, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he could find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for leaves. That's in Mark. Then we first of all think he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. When in actual fact, what Mark was saying, Jesus saw leaves on a tree when it was not the season for figs. And that's why he went there. I know I got you confused, but I will explain this. Okay, there's a, something about a fig tree that's, that's really unique. Early in the season, in some places, let's say have a bit of a microclimate, a fig tree could come very early into leaf. Now, what a fig tree does when it comes into leaf, at about the same time or just before it comes into leaf, it has what is known as an early fruit. It's not very good. It's not very tasty. People don't go out of their way for it. But you can eat it if you're really hungry. So it wasn't the season for figs, but there's a fig tree that's in leaf. And then Jesus says, if it's in leaf, it has an early fruit, and I'm hungry. That fig tree was advertising, I have fruit. But it was false advertising. It did not have fruit when Jesus Christ said, every reason to expect an early fruit that could take his hunger away. This is an acted out parable, brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ came to a fig tree expecting fruit, even though it was out of season. In the same way, he came to Israel. He is the Son of God, was born of woman, came to his own people, the light shining in darkness. As a 12-year-old, he was in the temple. He listened to all those lessons. He saw the sacrifices, all that blood being shed in Jerusalem, all pointing to his blood on the cross of Golgotha. He expected a people who would love their God, who would rejoice in the salvation that God brought to them, who were longing to meet the Christ, who John the Baptist said, he is at hand, he is very near. But to Jesus Christ's shock, the people weren't waiting for him. They were not living in faith. They, they were not bearing the fruit of holiness and righteousness to God. It was like false advertising. They advertised, we are the church, we are the people of God, but deep down, they were not. They were like a fruitless fig tree. There was no fruit growing on this tree. And we understand that the enormous problem for Israel was the spiritual leadership of that day. Jesus Christ describes them as sheep without a shepherd. Indeed, they were trying to murder him at that very point. But it's not just the spiritual leaders, the people themselves. They have been so richly blessed three years of listening to Jesus preaching, all the healing that went on. Jesus sent out the 12. He sent out the 72. I would think that by the time of our text, there's hardly a serious ill person left in Israel. They'd gone through the land. The blind received their sight. The demon possessed their demons were driven out. People have been healed. People had listened to this amazing preaching of Jesus Christ. They had just sang their hosannas. In a couple of days, they will say, kill him, crucify him. Where was the fruit that Jesus Christ could have expected? And as we see in that parable of the tenants, they were all ready to murder the Christ. And so Jesus Christ cursed the fruitless fig tree. It withered. Notice that Jesus adds these words, let no fruit grow on you 
ever again. This is still part of the acted out parable, cursing the fig tree, watching it wither. You understand that when a fig tree withers, when it doesn't produce fruit anymore, somebody's going to chop it down and turn it into firewood. And Jesus Christ is saying to Israel, you are the dead tree. Your branches are going to be cut off and they're going to be thrown into fire. You know, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ would say in Matthew 24, just a couple of chapters later, Jerusalem and the temple would be torn down. And we know that in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed by the Romans. They carried all the contents of the temple back, back to Rome. And you could say, you know what? That temple was uh, going to come to an end anyway with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember the ripping of the, the veil? There's a planned obsolescence to the temple, and that's true. But it should have been done in a meaningful, beautiful, joyful way. With the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, the chief priest should have been there and says, Hallelujah! It's a new day. It's a new beginning. I, I guess we'll start to take the temple apart and, and get rid of the, the, the altar because there's going to be no more sacrifices because the great Passover lamb has died and pay for our sins. But nobody was saying that. Nobody was prepared for Jesus Christ. And he said, this nation is going to wither and die, and we're going to move on with Pentecost out into the whole world. There's obviously a, a strong warning here for the church of all times and places, and that includes us today, brothers and sisters. And I, and I understand that it's sometimes hard to hear the harsh voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we long to hear words of love, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. But our Lord Jesus Christ also came with warning. It could be a very stern warning. I remember at the end of his Sermon on the Mount when people were gobsmacked at the preaching of Jesus. They said, we never heard anything like this. Jesus warned them. He warned them and he said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And what Jesus Christ was saying there is it's not enough just to say, Lord, Lord. It's not enough just to say, I am a member of the church. I am a member of the Panoka United Reformed Church. It's not enough. It can condemn us. It's not enough that you're here today. It's not enough that we give our children a Christian education. The Lord demands our heart. As we sang in Psalm 1, someone who delights in the law of God and wants to surrender his life to the praise and the glory of God. God wants our heart a heart that is washed in the blood and spirit of Jesus Christ, a heart that says, hallelujah, I am a child of God, and I surrender my whole life to him. And the fruit comes out in our thoughts, words, and deeds. This is what our Lord Jesus Christ is looking for from us today as well. And we will elaborate on this in our second, in our final point. You notice the reaction of the disciples. They are amazed and ask, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? Not their finest moment. Jesus said more often to his disciples, O oh, oh ye of little faith. They had watched Jesus calm the storm. They had watched him drive out demons. Was it really so hard to curse the fig tree and, and cause it to, to, to wither? So the, the disciples should actually have understood the message of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, we have seen that the, the acted out parable of Jesus Christ, which is a condemnation of God's covenant people who were not showing the fruit of faith. And, and that, that resulted in a, a demonstration, a lack of faithfulness. But Jesus was saying to his disciples, but there is a way of... of bearing new fruit. And I'm going to use you men as my disciples and apostles for a new day, a 
new tree, a new people, and a new bearing of fruit. But he says to his disciples, you need faith. No doubting. Don't you hesitate in who I am and what we can do together. You notice that Jesus Christ says here, assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you probably know this, but when it says in your Bible that Jesus says, assuredly, he's saying in Greek, amen. And whenever Jesus says, amen, or amen, amen, he is saying, focus. Pay attention to this. This, you, this will make it or break it for you. You need faith and not doubting. And faith, of course, is, is a knowledge of our God and an assurance of his promises in Jesus Christ. I think a, a pivotal passage is with Jairus. Remember the synagogue ruler? His daughter is dying, and he wants Jesus to come and save his daughter. And then the daughter dies, and the people say, you know, you may as well go home. Your daughter is dead. Then Jesus stops and says to Jairus in Mark 5, don't be afraid, only believe. Have faith. If you believe in me, says Jesus Christ, miracles will happen. Amazing things will happen. And you know, brothers and sisters, we could say at this point, yeah, I need faith. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to become that man, that woman, that boy or girl of faith. I'm going to have that faith. Good luck with that. It's not going to happen if you say that. Some people say, well, I'll read my Bible. You know what? Reading, reading the Bible can be one of the most harmful things that you do in your life. What's the point of reading the Bible? You read it. Two minutes later, you've forgotten it. Well, we discovered from Psalm 1, and what's the whole point of our Lord Jesus Christ's ministry is that when you have the Word of God and you read it, you meditate on it. You take the time and say, what is God actually saying here? What does that mean for me? How is this real in my life? And I promise you, my brother and sister, that if you try this, if you read your Bible and you reflect on it, and you meditate on it, it's unbelievable that layer after layer unpeels and, and you get to know your God, how amazing he is, what he has given to us in Jesus Christ, and how we long to be his children, able to live to his praise and to his glory. It's people who meditate on the word of God and pray in connection with that for them the Word of God becomes real. Faith grows. We hold on to this God. We want a relationship with this God. It's got to be real. It's got to be personal. And that changes our lives to the praise and the glory of God. Jesus Christ says to his disciples, if you have faith, you can do amazing things. You will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it will be done. Pick up a mountain. If you have faith, pick up a mountain and throw it into the sea. Now, we say that's a, that's a hyperbole. That's a bit of a, an exaggerated statement. But the point of the Lord Jesus Christ is that if you have faith, you can do things you never dreamed was possible. You can do miracles. Now, I don't think that miracle literally meant a mountain tossing because I never read that Jesus or his disciples were into mountain tossing. So that's obviously an image for something else. And of course, there we come again to our whole text. Our Lord Jesus Christ has just in his acted out parable said, people of Israel, it's over. You're, you're no longer going to have that status as the elect people of God. You had everything. And it's coming down now. The dead branches are going to be torn off and they're going to be thrown into fire. People say, well, what's left? If Israel, if they're finished as a special people of God, what is left? I mean, there's, there's a world out there, but they're Gentiles, they're foreigners, people of different color and different walks of life. 
they're not Jews. Our Lord Jesus Christ says, have faith, and you will toss mountains. And you know what, brothers and sisters? Uh, very soon, Jesus would die, rise again, ascend into heaven, and pour out his spirit. And his 12 disciples, and later the Apostle Paul, would start preaching. And we read in Acts, and we read further, what happens? Hundreds, thousands of people, in one day, came to know and believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The church starts spreading over the face of the whole world. It's a global church. That's mountain tossing. That's performing miracles. And we're seeing it today. I know that we get a little disillusioned sometimes with Canada, with North America. So much hostility to the church. People leaving the church. People mocking the church. But we need to have faith that our Lord Jesus Christ will always gather, defend, and preserve his church and he's doing it worldwide. In the Northern Hemisphere, the church seems to be shrinking, but in the Southern hem Hemisphere, it is exploding. I have been in China. There are Christians left, right, and center. There are millions of them, even though they are being persecuted. In South Africa, in Africa, they're pleading with us to send them sermons and send them good literature, and you know what they say? The better you educate us, the better we'll be prepared in a few years to send missionaries to Canada to try to work for the church gathering work in Canada. Brothers and sisters, miracles are happening in our world today, and miracles are happening here in Pinoka as well as Jesus Christ continues to gather, defend, and preserve his church. We can toss mountains. And you know, there's, a, there's a, a little something to our text. Jesus doesn't just say you can toss mountains. You can toss this mountain. And he's standing there between Bethany and Jerusalem. What is this mountain? This mountain is Jerusalem. It has the temple on it. It's about to be picked up and thrown into the sea. It is about to be over. It is about to end. But there's a dawn of a new day, a new building of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, a day where every believer will be a, a living stone built into the body of Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in our midst. The church is gathered throughout the world from every nation, from every walk of life, and everyone is a living stone built into the church. And, and bears the fruit of a people who rejoice in their salvation and live to the praise and the glory of our God. So in this parable of the worked out parable, acted out parable of the fig tree, we find a, a terrible warning against the people of Israel, but also a new beginning, a glorious beginning, the miracle of Jesus Christ's church gathering work. And soon all the elect will be gathered in. And our Lord Jesus Christ will return on the clouds of heaven and gather all his people into a paradise restored where we will bear the fruit of joyful hearts living to the praise and the glory of our God. My brother, my sister, if you hear the trumpet sound, and you see your Lord Jesus Christ returning in the clouds of heaven, will you be ready? Will you have fruit in your life? Amen. Let's draw near to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, this morning and this afternoon, and for the opening of your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that it is a covenantal word full of promise from you, but also the demand that we have faith and that we live from that faith, showing the fruit of a people who keep in step with the Holy Spirit and walk with the Holy Spirit bearing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We pray, Father, that like a fig tree full of
figs, sweet, beautiful figs, we are a people who are filled with the fruit of thoughts, words, and deeds that are to your praise and glory. And we know, Father, that we can't do that in our own strength. We do that in Jesus Christ. And we pray that we have that personal relationship with him, a walk with Jesus that comes from knowing him in his word, meditating on it, reflecting on it, and coming nearer to you as God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Be with us in the coming week, Heavenly Father. We pray that throughout the coming week, we have our times of prayer, we have our time of Bible reading, reflection, and meditation. And we find that, that you always are with us and always give us what we need. If we're being tempted to sin, you give us the strength to resist that. If we're going through a hard time, we, have, we hear from the doctor sad, difficult news, you support us. We pray, Father, that we may always find our refuge in you, our God, our shepherd, our heavenly Father. We pray, Father, that you would guide us in all that we do this week. We are thinking also of the federal election. We've all heard a lot from the leaders and the parties. We've heard from the media, and we, we realize that most people probably have a really hard time understanding what's what and what's going to happen. But we pray, Father, that you will guide this nation and you will guide the election process, that you will give a government to this country that best shows and reflects that the authority of this government is from you, and you give us a, a government to curb sin and licentiousness, to give peace, to give an environment in which the church can flourish. We pray, Father, that we may have a government that gives us freedom of religion, that allows us to bring the message out there that we can talk about things like abortion and sexuality and, and, and minorities, that we, can, that we can, as a church, be a light to society around us. We pray, Father, for your blessing on the election tomorrow. Father, next weekend, up in Edmonton, there's a creation science weekend. We read about that in the bulletin. We're thankful for the men and women and young people involved in this, trying to, to show the relevance of Genesis 1 and 2, that you are the God who created this world in six days, and you made it perfect, and you gave man a, a mission, a purpose in this life. We pray, Father, for good talks and good education in the coming weekend. Father, we also pray for word and deed. We realize that there's a lot of challenges in Ecuador, Haiti, Papua, New Guinea, and other places. Also, the, your people, your church, is threatened in some of these places. We pray, Father, that you would preserve them, grant them what they need, and that you would bless the work of word and deed. Father, we pray for our farmers. We pray that the crops may be brought in, the fields cleared, and that we may receive food and drink both as human beings and animals in due season. We praise you, Father, as the God of creation and of the seasons, and we trust in your providential care. Father, we, we pray for our minister, Reverend Mitch Rankasun, that you would continue to be with our brother. Father, we are thankful that you have been with him and he is feeling better. We pray that you continue to bless him and his wife and allow him to continue his ministry. Father, we recognize that this too is from your hand. And we pray that for him and for us as congregation, we may rejoice in your blessing. Father, we ask that you would bless us as families, bless our marriages. We pray that as husband and wife, we love each other. We cherish each other. That we realize that in our relationship, we grow stronger in our relationship with you. 
We pray also that as, as parents, we set a good example for our children of holiness, of being fruitful trees, that our children also want to be like dad and mama, walk in your ways. We pray for the single parent. We pray for the widow and the widower, that you would comfort them and be near to them. Be also with our young people who are thinking, perhaps looking for a life partner. We ask that you would be a guide to them, that they may also find someone who shares their values, who shares their faith. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with us in all that we do this week, education of our children, the catechism classes, the work of the office bearers. We pray, Father, for your love and grace. We adore you. We love you. We stand in awe of you. And we thank you that we may be called your children, for that is what we are. Please hear our prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us sing together.